Thank you. We are now live. Morning. I would like to say a welcome to members, officers and members of the public to this joint staff consultative committee. Before the meeting starts, the chair and vice chair have sent their apologies. Therefore, we need to elect a chair for the meeting. Could I have, please have nominations for chair for this meeting? Certainly, I propose Councillor Claire Strong as a chair. Thank you, Councillor Hone. And a seconder? I'll second that. Thanks, Tom. Right. Um, Councillor Strong is elected chair for this meeting. Thank you. We will email you across a copy of the chair's notes. And in the meantime, we will do a roll call for you. So can I confirm the following members and officer in attendance and can hear us and we can hear them? Councillor Claire Strong. Good morning, everybody. And I can hear you, although you are a bit faint. Sorry. Thank you. I shall get my man. Under my chin. Thank you. Councillor Terry Hone. Yes, President, correct. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Tom Platter. Muted. Tom. I'll try again. Present then, can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Rebecca Webb. Good morning. Ian Cooper. Good morning, everyone. Debbie Eland. Good morning, everyone. Christina Corr. Good morning, everyone. Maggie Williams. Good morning and Lewis Franklin. Good morning. Thank you. Are there any other members or officers in attendance? Okay, we'll go through some of the functions. Members may request to speak using the raise hand function and the same function will be used to vote. The chair will notify you when it is your turn to speak. Are there any questions before we start the meeting? Okay, I will now hand over to the chair. Thank you very much. I'm just waiting for those uh, notes to come through. But in the meantime, um, welcome everybody. Um, so item one on the agenda, apologies for absence. Can somebody from community services just, just remind me, we have apologies from... Yes, apologies have been received from Council Elizabeth Dennis Harburg and Raj Bakar. Um, I don't believe there are any further apologies. I have just sent through the chair's notes to your email address, so they should be with you shortly. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much. I've now got my notes. Um, I can see Debbie Elan's got a hand up as well, Chair. Debbie. Oh, thank you. It's just that Dee Levitt did send her um, apologies and I'm attending in her place. Thank you very much, Debbie. I'm sure, can we have to make sure that those are noted? So no more apologies, moving on. So item two on the agenda is the minutes from our meeting on the 14th of December. Can we please take those agreed and read? I'm happy to propose them from the chair as I was there. I'm happy to second. Thank you. So can we just quickly approve those minutes, please? I think it's you and me, Tom, because I don't think Terry was there. I expect you'll be abstaining. I can still raise a hand, though. <laughs> That's fine. Sorry, I'm just uh, getting to the hand. Fault, but yeah, OK. Raise um, hand. OK, Thank they you. have been approved by members consensus. OK. So item three, chair's announcements. And just to remind everybody that this meeting is being audio um, and video recorded and the recordings will be available on ModGov and YouTube after the meeting. Members are a member reminded to make any declaration of interest before the item the de and a detailed reminder about this and speaker rights is set out under the, the announcements that's on the agenda. That's clear. Then I'll move to item four, which is the staff Consultative Forum Minutes, and this is Ian Cooper to present. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as ever, the Staff Consultation Forum is always an interesting and varied discussion on lots of different items. Um, so you've got the minutes in front of you from the meetings from December, January and February. Um, so just to kind of give a brief summary of what has been discussed, uh, we provide a 
updates on the matters being considered by both council and cabinet. It might be of interest to staff in each of those meetings. Um, and then the sort of usual structure is that then we have, if there are any restructures happening, they will be discussed in the meeting. So in this period, we've had the community engagement restructure, and that was discussed at that meet at one of the meetings. Uh, and then there's always a chance for employees to raise any queries they have. Um, I guess the recurring query um, from this quarter has been around the office and making sure it's nice and tidy. Um, so kind of a discussion around that and then making sure there's a reminder about to all staff around how to kind of look after the place and make it nice for everyone to work in. Uh, there's a regular update on IT and usually when the IT officers comes along and asks any questions and provides an update and answers any questions. Uh, the focus this period has been on the new version of the laptops for all staff, uh, which should make us all a bit more efficient uh, by getting rid of some of the, the software that sits in the background. Uh, there's also uh, HR updates, but I don't want to spoil the kind of next item on the agenda, so I won't cover those here. Um, but that's kind of the summary of what was discussed. But if you want to pick out any individual uh, items of discussion from those minutes, happy to answer, answer questions on them. Any questions? Before I ask mine. Tom, do you want to go? Do you, have you go on? No, I'm good, thank you. Okay. Um, the one thing I, I did pick up, and that's about IT equipment, with obviously staff changing from and getting laptops and everything, is how often do staff members do what I call a workstation assessment? Uh, they are reminded to do it every year. Uh, we also prompts them to, uh, but obviously it's up, up to their, up to them to sort of do it themselves, to do it every time they change their desk situation. So if they were to change where they work at home, they should be doing a DSC assessment then. Obviously it's more difficult to keep track of that, which is why there's the annual process on top of that to make sure that at least every year they're captured to do one. Yeah, I mean, I was, to me, health and safety, and that, particularly from workstation, if they are changing, do need to get them ready and, and make sure that they are, we are, you know, you are checking up that, that they are doing them regularly. Because that's the you know if there is a, a health issue that can result from changing a workstation, it really does need to be picked up and managed. So I'm pleased to hear that. If there are no further questions, I think then we just need to note these reports. Julie noted. Thank you. Uh, the next item then we have on our agenda was item six, which is a discussion pa uh, paper on the council values. And Rebecca, I believe you're to present. I think, Chair, um, we should have the information note first. I don't know which order the agenda has that in, but usually we do the information note before the discussion papers. You're right. OK. You can see I'm very rusty at being chair. Not, not a problem at all. <laughs> um, okay. Let's go back one then. Item, yeah, item five is the information, is our information note then. Lovely. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a few points um, to highlight from our information note this time. Um, starting at 3.2, because recruitment selection remains to be a focus um, for the team, and we're working closely with recruiting managers to find solutions, particularly where filling posts is starting to become more difficult. 3.3 um, provides an update on our recruitment refresh project, um, and the work is ongoing. Main areas of the current work um, include looking at our recruitment pages on our website, so we're working with our communications team to develop um, a new look to our web pages, which um, will help to better attract candidates and better reflect us as an employer. Um, we've started to increase our social media presence um, with regard to recruitment, and we're looking to further develop this um, with the way that we present roles using a variety of wording and graphics. Uh, we recently ran a recruitment and selection training session for managers, um, and this included updated information about the recruitment market and how to best approach recruitment at this time. The HR team are ensuring timely advice is offered to managers around that changing recruitment market, um, including things like being ready for challenging questions at interview from candidates um, and ensuring that 
our recruiting managers really do their best to sell us as an employer at that point um, of the recruitment process as well. Um, there have been updates to the job description document um, with a view to making bringing the job description and person specification together with a view to making it uh, a more simple document for both candidates and managers. Um, and we're trying different methods to fill hard to fill posts. Um, so we are using our welcome payment um, and we're considering looking at testing rolling recruitment, which would involve us closing the advert when we find a suitable applicant rather than waiting until the end of an advertising period. Um, and that's really the decision to do that hasn't happened yet. We're in discussion about it, um, but it's really reflecting the changing market and the speed at which things are moving in that market. Um, in addition to this, we've been trialing use of an in-house recruitment agency at Essex County Council who are operating at a low cost basis. And they're providing us with advertising on their website, as well as a range of job, job boards, including the disability jobs and LGBT jobs um, and premium LinkedIn adverts. Um, at this stage, it's too early to conclude whether this is going to have an impact on our ability to effectively fill vacancies, but we are keen to explore it as an option. And then 3.5 with the clear link to recruitment, um, covers turnover and we continue to monitor turnover rates and review exit data and provide feedback to managers. 3.6 includes the normal um, update on our apprentice scheme. Um, just to note that we had National Apprenticeship Week um, in February, which gave us a really good opportunity to thank our brilliant apprentices um, and continue to highlight the apprenticeships we offer at North Hearts, as well as encourage people into a career in local government in general. Um, a quick note on 3.8 and 3.10. So the benefits review work is ongoing. Um, some of the changes have been launched, um, which you'll see from the information note, and some continue to be progressed in the background. Um, we've also been working on our employee assistance programme review and we'll see a launch of a new provider from the 1st of April. Um, and this provider will give employees options on how they make contact for support, as well as lots of online support and wellbeing resources. 313 um, covers a very short paragraph on the gender pay gap. So I just want to talk you through the update around this. So <clears throat> full background, the gender pay gap is about the difference in average hourly rates of pay between men and women. Um, and we must report on that annually. So we run data on a snapshot date, which is the 31st of March, and we publish that data um, before the 30th of March the following year. So we're about to publish the 2022 data for North Hearts Council, and this is showing our mean pay gap as 19.1%. This is an increase from the 2021 data, which was 17.4%. So North Hearts have got a number of schemes and processes in place that support equalities and diversity, and this includes gender. So we have um, an organisational value of inclusion. We have really well-established flexible working. Many roles offer flexibility on hours, patterns, locations. We have an anonymised shortlisting process. We have an inclusion group that focuses on equality, diversity and inclusion topics um, including gender, and that feeds into leadership team. Um, we have checking of recruitment documentation to ensure gender neutral language is used. Wellbeing support is available, um, including support on specific issues, including menopause. We have started welcome back meetings for those returning from maternity leave. We've got a broad range of training and development, including workshops focused on developing confidence in the workplace. And we have um, well-established pay transparency um, and job evaluation schemes. Previous years, um, so from 2017 through to 2020, have seen a reduction in the pay gap at North Hearts. And we're committed to continue that downward trend that we've seen over those previous years. 
and the inclusion group will be working with HR to develop an action plan to continue the positive work that's already in place. Um, and then finally, 13, no, 3.14 um, gives us an overview of our absence figures and the team continue to support managers with absence management. Um, the key area here is that COVID absence has reduced significantly. And this appears to be due to minimal testing in general. Um, therefore, unless there are objections from the group, I suggest that we no longer report on COVID absences in this way in the paper, um, but continue the normal absence analysis. And if there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them. Any questions? Councillor Hone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, maybe I'll give it one more turn before we, we scrap COVID just in case, but uh, I'll leave that to you, Chair, to recommend that what you want to do. Uh, when it comes to uh, planning officers, yes, uh, any consolation county have similar problems um, in recruitment of uh, the planning department, like we do at North Hearts. Uh, in fact, all of the staffing and recruitment, I think recruitment at uh, Hertfordshire County Council is being reviewed by a topic group, a scrutiny topic group coming up soon. So they will look at that and they'll be homing in on places like planning, uh, which does seem to be more heavily impacted. In the leaving um, speeches we had with our interviews, was uh, any particular reasons coming out as to why we're seeing those five leavers? Um, they are generally related to um, promotions, um, but there there are varied reasons. So when we're, we're not seeing a real key trend in the, that lever, that exit data at the moment. Um, Thank you. Sorry, sorry, if there was a trend, we ought to be aware of it. If there's not a trend. Absolutely. If they just, uh, you know, any, pick any one of, of 10 reasons why, then okay, it's uh, that satisfies me. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Councillor Plater. Just to follow up on that, um, you said about promotions, is that because you're finding that um, officers are not able to be promoted up at North Hearts. And so you've got junior officers and officers who have got promotions who are then leaving the council because other, other councils and other sectors can offer them the promotions that they're looking for. We, we do see some of that, yes. Um, I think that we are particularly good at North Hearts at developing our staff. So we often see people being very well developed, having some great experience in a role, um, but then not having the progression necessarily because there's another person in that, that role. We don't, we're not a huge council, so we don't have multiple posts for people to move into. Um, with local government, there is always the pay issue as well. So at the moment, in the, in the, current, um, in the current environment, people, some, a lot of people are struggling and are looking for jobs, um, promotion or not, that, that will pay more. So I think there's, there's that reflection in there as well. Thank you. The other um, question was on the gender pay gap and you said it had gone up this year after going down previously. Is there a, is there a, a reason that you can pinpoint for why the snapshot is, is higher this year? Because all the work that I know you've been doing has, has been incredible and it there's been some real steps taken forward so it's obviously a, a little bit of a shock with all of the positive steps forward to see the the gap slide slide back a little bit this year yes i think in general the picture remains the same um i think that this time we're, we're still seeing um less women in senior roles and that's the same picture although um, we may be seeing slight improvements, very small changes with staff leaving have an impact on that percentage. Um, at the time of reporting, we had an additional service director who was male, um, and that will have an impact on this, this data from 2022. Thank you. Uh, you did mention planning officers. And again, given the time that this report was written, have we had any good news on vacancies in the planning department and getting any of those filled? We 
they're in progress. We are starting to see some um, better news, yes, but nothing um, nothing that's formally confirmed as yet. Okay, but but at least at least it's it looks as though it, that sounds positive. So thank yeah. you for that. And the other comment I want to ask is you mentioned about the change of provider for the employee assistance program. Now, in the past, that employee assistance program, I believe, was also open to members. Yeah. So um, it's just if you're going to, I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, have I seen any notification as a member that that is changing and the new, con you know, the new contacts for that? So I just, just wanted to make sure that if that was happening, that we were going to be informed. Yeah, you absolutely will be. Um, no, staff haven't seen the new information yet either. So they're aware that there's a new provider, but don't have the links, don't have the telephone number or anything like that yet. Councillors will be informed, yes. Thank you. Um, oh. Councillor Payton. No, sorry, just a quick one. Um, do you have a doors, front doors? Do you have a time scale for when that will be um when we'll start seeing those details come out? Um, well, it launches on the 1st of April, so it will be before then. <laughs> OK, obviously. <laughs> not long, is it? Yeah. And I'm not sure if we've lost Tom or we just lost or lost his companion. Because <laughs> um, we can't see him. And um, just on that, it gets so. I can never remember exactly but it, it, with the old system, but I assume all the details for contact and what information as a you know as a employee or as a, a counsellor you need to pass over to get that system. I mean, I, again, from when I was working, I know that those sort of employee assistant programs are extremely useful for employees because they've got that confidentiality. They've got somewhere to reach out, and it's not it, it often if they've got an issue or problem that's the first place they will turn for their help to help them sort out an issue or problem they have. So yeah. very key and very important to me that that gets rolled out and all the staff do know where that lifeline is if they need it. Yeah, absolutely. I fully agree. And we'll make sure that the information is out available to all staff and members um, before the first, before the contract begins. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for those assurances. Anything else from anybody on on that? Yeah, I, I think, uh, Chairman, we've got to make a decision whether or not. Well, Rebecca asked whether or not she wants to drop off the COVID. Oh, yes. And, um, immediately um, and ask for our opinion on that. Your thoughts on that, Chair? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, perhaps, perhaps a plate, you put your hand up. Perhaps I'd let you come in first. I mean, I'm 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 inclined to agree with Rebecca, the fact that we've seen COVID related absences drop to, I think it was two I saw on, that we saw, we've been told on the report. And the fact that, you know, testing is not happening is, is and is not widespread now. So it seems to me as good a time as any to, to drop COVID specific um, absences off the report on the proviso that obviously if COVID then flares up again, or we get a new strain come that they can be, they can be put back on um, on a, I guess, on, on a basis that is felt needed, if that makes sense. Yeah, yes, I think, I think, I kind of share your view. I think if we suddenly saw a large rise in absences, then we'd probably want to know what, if there was a, a root cause for that, and the suspect might be COVID. Um, but I, I think the, probably the issue we have is that most people I know, unless they've got underlying um, health issues where they are visiting or in co contact with people that are particularly vulnerable, are not doing the testing. So um, I, kind of, I kind of share that, do we need to granulate that part out? But on the other hand, if it flared up, I think your point about bringing, a, bringing it back in is, is valid. But I've got a hand up from Debbie. Yes, thank you, Chair. I was just going to ask if there was um, kind of any prevalence of long COVID and whether that had um, was included in the figures and, and what the impacts of, of, of that were. Thank you. Um, not prevalence, but we, we have seen cases of long COVID. Um, there is an ongoing case of long COVID um, and we're providing support 
um, as necessary to managers and staff, um, managers that are managing it and staff that are dealing with it. So are we agreed then that we won't, moving forward, we'll, we will not continue to take a figure for COVID? Is, is that agreed between the three of us? Okay. Are we happy yeah. with that? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, if there's no more questions or points to raise, we just to approve... The report do we just approve it yeah. poof happy to accept and approve in favor all of those in favor yes councillor plater oh you're doing hand raises that way sorry i thought you were asking to speak <laughs> okay thank you for that so now we move on to item six and the discussion paper on council values and that's rebecca thank you chair um do you want us to take this as read and start a discussion or would you like me to run through it? Take us through it I think because often when you say something it might prompt us more because okay. you might pick out something that I skimmed over when I was reading it. Okay okay so this discussion paper is around how values can shape the culture at the council. So um, as a reminder, our values are listening together, learning, adaptable and inclusive. And they're about describing what's important to us as a council. Um, organisational culture is around the values and belief that are shared. It's about how things are done around here and the, the glue that holds everything together. Um, so in practice, um, and this is the, the last part of the paper, which I think is the, the piece that needs the most discussion. Um, how, how can values be used in practice to, to help to create that culture? So um, as a way of being an employer of choice for potential candidates, so where people work is important to them. Um, in a competitive employment market, attracting candidates explicitly using the values um, will help to ensure alignment of staff and the council, and that could make a real difference. Um, we can use it in practice as a means to establishing clear expectations and managing performance. So through job descriptions, um, regular performance reviews, and within our kind of conduct and capability policies, um, integrate them into all of our training, particularly those that relate to priorities, um, work towards an alignment between officer values and those demonstrated by members in their role, to aid decision making. So uh, embedding that question of, is this in line with our values? And that should really form part of um, all the decisions across the board at leadership team, SMG. Um, and then ensuring consistency of approach with behaviours. And then as, as an aid to recruitment by ensuring we appoint staff with personal values that are, are aligned with the organisation values. So we could build some of this into our recruitment criteria um, or ensure that managers ask questions at recruitment that are in line with our values. Thank you. Discuss, is that? <laughs> um, I get, I mean, I love the values because, but they're on paper. And that's the problem I always have with this stuff. It's how do you take something that's on paper and make it the reality? And I suppose one of the questions I would probably ask back is what are the barriers that, that maybe are seen from employees into actually making sure that the values that we set on paper are the reality when we come into a work situation? I think there's a lot there about that repeated message. So when we talk about embedding, it's about um, people 
using our values as part of their everyday work that that piece there about um, it being part of decision making that doesn't just need to be it's not the formal decisions we're also talking about those day-to-day things so there's there's the piece around that continued communication and feeding it through every little thing that we do all of our processes all of our discussions um so that it it will then become reality rather than just the the piece of paper or the screen that it sits on anybody else terry yeah thank you i guess it raises the question of evaluating employees and how they are brought into those principles and how they respect them and utilize them and is, if that's part of discussion process in the perf annual performance reviews i would imagine it should be and it should be the first thing you go through um before we get down to the details of performance thoughts please absolutely it's part of our um standard appraisal documentation um and it's it, it should form, obviously we talk about objectives, but it should form a main part of that conversation around um, how all of our people are working to those values. Thank you. Um, just going back, sorry, Chair, if you don't mind me, just going back on the, the, the question that you raised around barriers. So I think there's the, there is also a piece about making sure people, our people understand what the values mean for them because it's different across the board and people do lots of different jobs at the council so um, to support some of that understanding of course we have it in our appraisals and um, talk about it whenever we can uh, but we've set up um, monthly development mornings for all staff and over the next year we're talking about um, a, a specific value um, every other month and getting people to really consider what it means to them. So we we had adaptable at the last um, monthly session and teams were asked to get together and have a conversation about how they've adapted and think about really good examples of how they've adapted. We also have our employee recognition scheme um, and that is focused around the values. So you start to see really good examples of how people have worked within and beyond the values that we've set um, and that sets to so starts to set it out for others um, ensuring that understanding and that we're all moving in the same direction. Councillor Plater. Yeah just to follow up on that and then I'll go to my point. Um, you mentioned the monthly uh, employee sort of meetings. What's the uptake been on on those from employees? Uh, the development mornings yeah 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 um we don't always know because it, it's left to the the manager to ensure that those take place um there was a discussion at the inclusion group this week um and it's clear that although lots of people aren't able to do it on that actual morning most are able to rearrange and pick it up at another date or another time. So, um, yeah, it's we're always encouraging the take up of that and the commitment of staff to their own their own development. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, my next question probably puts Ian a little bit on the spot, um, but obviously we're talking about uh, organisational culture and, and values and a lot of that comes and in any organisation comes down from the senior leadership team. So I just wondered what, Ian, your take was on, on the values, because we've talked a lot about the values and how they relate to em employees, um, sort of officers and, and managers, but how, how you feel that they're being utilised in decisions at, at sort of the service director level. I think we attempt and, you know, to, to, to apply exactly where we would to, to our stock. You know, I go through my performance appraisal and I equally go through the same process about first up, it's around the values, look at those first and how I'm applying that to what I'm doing. 
Um, so I don't think there's any difference, and I think it would be right. It's really important we demonstrate these from the top. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ian. Anybody else, she says, looking around her screen, knowing that we've only heard from councillors, would any of the members of staff like to comment? Because we always do like to hear positives and negatives. I'm looking for raised hands. We have heard from Ian. Ah, oh, I've got a hand up. Debbie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, I, I can certainly confirm that um, obviously um, the values are definitely a part of the, um, the process for um, our performance reviews. And, and they are discussed, um, not, not just obviously uh, uh, during that process, which is obviously a one-to-one -one process with your manager, but at team meetings, um, well, certainly the, our team meetings and stuff, we, we talk about um, those values, uh, um, monthly team meetings and stuff where, where all, all the team are getting together. So um, th those do take place. Um, and and on the um, development sessions, be, because they're they're usually on a Friday. For example, I, I don't work on Fridays, so those would normally be picked up um, at another time that's sort of kind of suitable for for me and 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 sometimes for for the rest of the team when we're we're getting together because there's other members of staff that don't work on Friday, so it, it it's just. Um, you know, the organisation is sort of kind of, you know, reminding us how important it is to take that time out and um, either get together, um, you know, as a team or, or as individuals to, you know, to develop yourself. And, and that is important. So, um, yeah, so usually uh, we would rearrange sort of kind of a time to do that. So that, that's how it works in our team anyway. Any other teams like to tell us how it works in their team? I'm looking around, I'm looking for hands. But perhaps I'll come back to you, Ian. When you're doing when you are attending the um the, the monthly staff forum meetings with staff, um, the staff consultation forums, do anything, does anything in that come out as a discussion from you know staff on anything they they want to raise around the values at all not recently um i think we had a bit of discussion when we sort of first launched the refresh values and i think they mentioned then um i think for particularly those that are attending the staff consultation form there probably are the people that are most aware of them and have kind of been through the cycle with us quite quite well um so therefore probably isn't cropping up through that group um recently but yeah definitely we launched them um but perhaps there is an opportunity there for us to maybe prompt a discussion again at, at scf just to kind of yeah give it give it another go for a different route just to kind of really reinforce as much as possible yeah because the fact that it doesn't come up as the discussion couple nobody raises it that can either mean anybody you know oh everything is fine but there's always that thing you know you're always asking is everything fine you know is every, you know everybody is aware and it, it it has rolled out nobody's happy with it or there's the i don't know how to raise it because i'm not happy so you've always got to find out if there is anything that needs raising or not so it's a, diff a difficult balance but i think the the opportunity as we say one of the values is listening but we can only listen if people speak up As a reminder, right now to the for the next meeting to uh, in, initiate a conversation. Thank you, Ian. I mean, that's as I said, it, these it looks lovely on the paper, but it's about as I would say, it's about you have to walk the talk as well. And you, it's reading it, walking it, feeling it, seeing it, and as you said, I think the fact that we have, um, particularly the you know the staff forwards that we do, where we're looking for those examples to say, and look, this is how because actually it is everything you do in your job. It's it, it should become natural to everybody to realise that actually they are aligned with the values. And so getting those examples out so people actually are not in fear of thinking, oh, am I? I they know actually know that they are 
in in and applying the values to to the to the council as you know as I think we all signed up and agreed we want them to be. So thank you for that then, Ian. So if I have no more hands raised, nobody else wants to talk about the discussion paper. Are you happy with that, Rebecca? You all right? Yes, thank you. Okay, in that case, it's just we just had to note the discussion paper. And again, I think um, we've got an action out of there for Ian. So thank you. Uh, so moving on then, I don't think uh, the next topic on our agenda is item seven, and this is the mandatory pay gap reporting and Maggie to report. Yes. Um, again, Chair, would you like me just to run through uh, what we've said there first? Um, yeah, happy to do that. Run through. Yep, happy to do that. Um, so uh, a pay gap is a, an undesirable or unfair difference between the average amounts that two sectors of a population are paid and the report um, that, that uh, comes from that will um, See, be seen as a basic indicator of inequalities in the workplace. So it's a, an important exercise to do. Um, and it's also important to remember the difference between a pay gap report and an equal pay uh, report. Equal pay looks at the differences in pay between individuals doing the same job or a job that's rated as equivalent for the skills, experience, uh, et cetera, required within it. Whereas a pay gap report is looking at everyone across the organization um, and, uh, and comparing uh, them by the different characteristics that they have. Um, and this discussion paper was looking at the, um, the mandatory pay gap reporting we have in the UK. Um, and, and very simply, I can say that the mandatory reporting that we have is, is the pay gap, uh, sorry, the gender pay gap, which we've had since 2017. And um, as Rebecca mentioned earlier, uh, the figures have to rep be reported annually. At present, it's uh, requ a requirement for those with um, uh, employees um, over 250 employees. But in fact, uh, moving forward from the uh, 2nd of October last year, the threshold for mandatory uh, pay gap reporting uh, was re raised to 500 employees. Uh, for any new regulations regarding pay gaps. Um, as an existing regulation, the gender pay gap reporting has not yet changed, uh, but it is a uh, forecast that for 2024, the, uh, the requirement will be uh, placed on employers with more than 500 employees. So, um, uh, North Hearts will therefore fall under the threshold uh, for mandatory reporting. But of course, there will uh, be a discussion, I'm sure, around the benefits of the reporting and continuing to do it on a voluntary basis. Um, I think the, um, the other point to make about um, having had uh, five years worth of uh, reports, six years worth of reports is... Um, it's going to be a long haul to rectify the gender pay gap. Uh, broad progress has been made, but it's been reported that it will take at least 20 more years to close the existing pay gaps if we're moving at the rates that we're currently moving at. So um, it's not something that's going to be fixed quickly. And of course, the pay gaps are not just um, limited to gender, they can also be applied to ethnicity, disability and other characteristics shared by a particular group. But um, as I mentioned, the gender is the only pay gap for which the law requires us to report at the moment. Uh, for 
about four or five years now, there's been a discussion around whether uh, the mandatory gap reporting should be extended to ethnicity gap reporting. And there was a lot of discussion and recommendations around uh, making it so um, as it was seen uh, to be a first step in addressing the pay disparities for employees from different ethnic backgrounds. However, uh, the government in 2022, uh, about a year ago now, stated it wasn't going to make ethnicity pay gap reporting mandatory. Um, part of the reasoning was it would be um, an extra burden on employers at a time that they were trying to focus on uh, post-pandemic recovery. And also there are a number of issues that rise uh, through ethnicity pay gap reporting that is not found um, for gender pay gap reporting. Uh, so gender pay gap reporting only uses two categories. Um, it doesn't incorporate those that are identified as non-binary. Um, but when we're looking at, at ethnicity, there are many uh, specific categories rather than just a few fraud, uh, a few broad groups. Uh, for example, the, the ONS has suggested that there could be uh, five categories and 18 subgroups of ethnicity to be used for collecting the data. And employers are encouraged to use specific ethnic groups rather than broader categories. So that would lead to a lot of analysis. It's a bit like the, the Premier League in that um, every every team has to play each other, though th thankfully for ethnicity reporting, it would only be playing each other once. But that would still, um, still mean that we'd need to do uh, 17 sets of analysis um, if we had 18 subgroups of ethnicity. And obviously that would raise a, a resource issue. Um, and also um, for smaller employers such as North Hearts, when we start to become as granular as that, we're going to then uh, get issues of um, identifying people in specific subgroups. Um, very small numbers involved, which can obviously skew percentages um, and such uh, and such. I can also there's another issue around ethnicity in that we would have to be sure that the pay gap uh, for employers up and down the country um, reflected the fact that in some areas the ethnic uh, makeup of the population is very different. So if you have a, a pay gap of a certain percentage, for example, in London, would look very different to that same pay gap in an area of the country where uh, the ethnic population um, in general was extremely low. Uh, and you don't have that issue with gender. So, um, yeah, there are a number of issues around it. But the, the government is still... Um, in favour of us looking at ethnicity uh, pay gaps and um, what they have uh, tasked the uh, Department of Business and Trade in doing is to produce some guidance to assist employers in looking at their ethnicity pay gaps and, um, uh, and trying to resolve some of those knotty problems that this analysis um, would throw up. Um, unfortunately, the guidance keeps being promised, hasn't been delivered. Um, and the most recent um, uh, information coming out of uh, out of the BEIS is that it's going to be published in due course. So it's a little bit like how long is a piece of string. But I suspect part of the problem is trying to um, get good guidance around some of the issues within uh, ethnicity pay gap reporting. Um, so I'm very happy uh, to answer any questions if I can, or obviously throw, throw it open for discussion now. Okay, are there any questions? I was gonna say thank you, Maggie. That was a uh, very, very informative. Uh, Councillor Hone. 
Yeah, I guess well, it does beg the question around the particular ethnicity of the staff that we have, the numbers and such like, the balance we have versus our community. How do we see that? Do we think we reflect the community or are there significant gaps between those sorts of things? Um, we look at that when we publish the other set of uh, information that we have to do each year, which is the equalities data, which is a breakdown of our current staff and our recruitment. And uh, whilst we do have obviously representation from uh, ethnic minorities within it, it is um, not in totally in line with the, the district um, the district profile it is something we look at um but at the moment it is not completely aligned thank you thank you terry as you say it's much easier to measure gender um, we look yeah having you know uh, celebrated those women particularly as we have a leader deputy leader and leader of the opposition that are all female and half of our directors are female on that we are ticking and i i guess it, you know it is it is as, as terry says it's whether or not if we're getting into ethnicity is whether or not it is reflective of the community that we have in this area i think you've outlined it it's it's a it's a bit of a thorny problem really to, to start measuring but i think that you know as you say we're not big enough as a council uh, but we can make do measurement um, voluntarily. I guess the county must be big enough as an employer to actually have to publish their figures. Yeah, or, or they would be if um, if for the Withman Desiree ethnic city reporting, but there isn't at the moment. So no, no. I, I don't know whether they do voluntarily. A number of large organisations do that. Um, a number of the large uh, public sec uh, private sector uh, do do that. Um, so there is information out there, but it's uh, voluntarily published. And I think the, the other aspect to gender pay gap, uh, sorry, ethnicity pay gap reporting is that um, in the uh, guidance that has been issued on it, that uh, they are saying that it, you, you can't just publish your figures, you have to publish um, an action plan and um, a narrative around the figures, which is not a requirement for gender pay gap, um, although it is strongly advised. So it may be that as part of the voluntary monitoring, some organisations are happy to internally monitor and review and put together an action plan they're just not prepared necessarily to go public on it uh, when they don't have to so i think there is probably quite a lot of ethnicity monitoring um, around but um maybe not everyone wants to uh, wants to put it out there for for other organizations to see you're muted claire all right, Councillor Plater. Thank you. Um, and just to carry on that point, I guess it's a question for Maggie or Rebecca. Is this something that we that we do monitor internally at the council at the moment? And do we have an action plan um, with regards to ethnicity pay gap reporting? We don't monitor it as a pay gap at the moment. Um, as, as I said, we do look at it through our equal pay reviews, which we do um, every two years. And we do look at it um, in both uh, recruitment and current staff each year when we do our equalities data reporting. And we analyse that information and pull out trends um, for which we will then uh, put together actions, but not specifically the ethnicity pay gap. Um, we don't measure that. Thank you. Uh, Re Rebecca. Just to add to that, um, I think it's important to note the work going on within the inclusion group. So although we're not um, carrying out the pay gap analysis on ethnicity. Um, ethnicity is one of the main subjects talked about at inclusion group. 
Um, we've our next discussion point for the next meeting um, is around the Halo Collective project, which is about um, hair discrimination within the workplace. So it, it's not that there's not work going on in the background discussions being had. Um, if if things are or when things are raised at inclusion group, there's um, actions coming out of that and that's kind of monitored in an action tracker. So. Um, there is work going on there, just not that that kind of formal pay gap um, monitoring. Thank you. And Ian, your hand was up and it went down. No, I was going to say, it's like something as Becca has just said, in terms it's far more important we concentrate on how we can solve the problem rather than just doing reporting it. It's not going to tell us anything new. Yeah. Okay, Are any further comments? If not, then um, we have, as a group, we have to note the discussion paper, which we are duly noting. Thank you. And then moving on, item eight is further discussion topics. As we've completed the cycle for this civic year. I guess we are looking for next civic year's topics. There are some that are on page. I can, oh, it doesn't give me the page number, sorry about that. But on the last page of our report, there page, are some. Page 31 it is actually. <laughs> there are some suggested to uh, topics, uh, discussion topics for future meetings. Oh, do any of those leap out of the page at us that we feel should be on the agenda for the next meeting, assuming that this committee still exists, and I'm sure it will do, because I have to say, for me, I think it's one of the important committees we have. Any thoughts? Any comments? Yeah, a few, I think, um, based on the discussions we've had today, really, isn't it? Is to try and drive through what, what we saw jump out at us today. So um, we certainly... We're talking about diversity, changing workplace accommodation practices. Um, attracting and rewarding scarce talent was something, wasn't it? Because of our planning uh, issues around recruitment. So there's a couple there for me which jump out as things that we came up in the, our meeting today, which we might want to uh, bring forward next time around or in the immediate future. Okay, Councillor Plater. Well, it's not something I say very often um, in council meetings, but I, I do agree with Councillor Hone um, on this. Uh, on this, I think those two topic discussions are, are two which you know we should be discussing. Um, the other one I just wanted to to bring up as a as an interest was to do with um, employment tribunals and um, employment law, which I think are are really important for for us to, to look at and take note of as well. So diversity, attracting and rewarding scarce talent and law tribunals here. Yeah? Things where we are here. Yeah? Rebecca. Um, it would be helpful to understand if we want to move forward with two discussion topics for the next meeting or whether we're looking at three. I My preference would be um, sticking to the two uh, since we've recently moved from just having one. If if we're able to agree. Well, we have those two, the first two I suggested, which uh, Councillor Plater agreed, have those two next time around and then the one after that, bring in tribunals and law. Does that suit you, uh, Tom? Yeah, yeah that's, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy with that, if that's agreed by the group. So, attracting and rewarding scarce talent, the next topic group. Yeah, along with 20s diversity, inclusion and changing workplace practices. That's all right for you, Rebecca? Yeah, that I think good. That, yeah. Okay, that sounds good. I think that's agreed by us all. Yeah, and then after that, the next one after that would be the uh, employee tribunals and law. Yeah. Yeah, and and what I just asked, obviously we we 
shouldn't set that in stone now just in case something new comes up that overrides it but Rebecca if you wouldn't mind making a note or or there be a note made in the minutes that it's something the committee would be looking to discuss at a, at a further meeting so we've got that as a reference point for the next meeting. Absolutely I'm sure we can do both yeah thank you. Okay Okay. I think that's then decided. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick if there's any other business anybody wanted to raise anybody got anything burning but they'll don't want to leave this meeting without having said in that case, can I thank everybody for coming and thank all the members of the public that might have been watching or if they have managed to do this catch up on YouTube. I um, hope and if you do have find anything that you've listened to or heard, you can always contact your local councillors to say what you think we also should be discussing or raising on behalf at, um, at this meeting. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody attending and thank you for indulging me as chairman. I thank you for volunteering to be chairman. Right, thank you and goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye all. Bye. Thank you. Bye.